What's up, everybody? Big Herc, getting down with Fresh Out, and you're tuned in to another interview. Hopefully, by now, you guys are subscribed. A lot of you guys watch, but you fail to hit the subscribe button, so make sure you subscribe and support so that we can keep bringing you this dope content. I'm here with the homie from Arizona, Peter, a.k.a. Chappie. This guy has been through it all. He's uh, seen some stuff that I think that you guys need to hear about, and um, we're going to get into it and let him tell the story. So, Peter, uh, tell the people a little bit about how you grew up and where you're from. So, I'm actually from Phoenix, Arizona, from a small town called Ahwatukee. Um, people used to make fun of me and call it All White Tukey when I got to the joint because known for that nicer area. Um, great family. Uh, thought I'd be an athlete. Got into drugs when I was younger. My parents split when I was 10. Didn't affect me. You know, I still had both my families, uh, both my parents and my family. Um, Life was good until I started messing with drugs, you know. Mm. Um, I experienced with those when I was probably 15, 16 years old um, and took no time at all to end up in prison. So did you um, stay with your, your, your mom or your dad or you split time between the both? Or? So when I was sober, I stayed with my dad. And then when I was off on the run doing some bad stuff, I lived with my mom, you know. So did the streets have a major influence on your drug use, do you say, as far as your friends? My friends didn't. Once me, like... I just have an addictive personality, so once I used that stuff for the first time, there was never enough of it for me, you know? Oh, uh, okay, so at that point, did you kind of throw aside all the athleticism as Everything. far as Everything, threw aside school. I was kicked out of school in a matter of no time. I uh, wasn't playing sports anymore. Um, started hanging out with not even my friends that were playing sports and just com changed my complete group of friends. Wow. And then in a period of two years, you know, I was sitting in there doing 12 years in prison. And so, what was the incident that led to you actually going to prison for that time? So, which it should have been my senior year of high school, um, 2003, spring break. Mm -hmm. um, Ten kids involved total. We just happened to go burglarize a house during spring break. Nothing even crazy, no home invasion, nothing dangerous about it. Um, but there was ten kids involved. I was 18, two of my other friends were 18. Um, my little brother and them were 16 and 15 at the time. Um, so it turned into a bigger ordeal than we even had thought at the time. And then state made it sound like I was influencing juveniles and like I had told them to go do this and mm. I didn't say anything and they just threw the book at me and I got 12 years for a non-dangerous theft charge and uh out of the 10 kids involved one other person had gotten two and a half years and he's the one that told on me and told him where all the jewelry was he got two and a half years and he had three more felonies than me um the 15 16 year old dog got probation and was that your first offense no I was on probation too at the time okay I wow. just got arrested at 18 got probation 18 and 12 years huh 12 years yes so what was it like going through that process as far as, you know, you, once you got locked up and dealing with the courts? I mean, did you have a, a private attorney or did you have a public, public defender? Or So I had just, when I turned 18, I had just gotten arrested. I actually <laughs> got arrested. I stole a brand new Mercedes Benz from the Mercedes Benz of Chandler for no reason other than the fact that I wanted a new Benz. And I mm. definitely couldn't afford one at 18 years old being a drug addict too, you know. Um, so I stole one of those and got out on probation and then got arrested a couple months later than that. My dad had helped me out with the first one. Since I just obviously didn't use any of that and got arrested again, he told me I was doing this myself. They started telling me I was going to go do six to nine years for the theft charge. So my dad, against his own, uh, what he had told me before, ended up getting me another street lawyer uh, to help me out. And I was supposed to get four and a half to six years on my sentencing. And then the judge just turned on and doubled it on my sentencing date. Damn. So as far as once you got sentenced and got, um, you know, booked into the system, man, um, what was that process? I mean... What, what happened, I mean, what prison did you go to and, and how that how that take place? So that was one of the harder things too is because I feel like a lot of people go to prison for a few years and you get out and then you see them when, when they get out. You know, I got sentenced to 12 years so I knew. I didn't think I was ever going to see any one of my friends again. Like 12, when you're 18 years old and you get 12 it's years. a long time. I mean, yeah, you, and my thoughts were so young at the time. All, all I can compare it to is when you're young, it's all you want to do is turn 18 when you're younger, right? And you think how long it takes to turn 18. 21. And now I'm thinking, I'm like, I have to do almost all that time again in prison now, you know? And I don't know. Wow, half your life. Yeah, literally. Yeah, half your life. Yeah, half my life. Wow. So um, it was hard. And then so I, I go to the prison yard, and for the first time in my life, I mean, I remember walking on that yard. I'm six. I'm 6'4", 250 now, but I used to be 6'1", 144 pounds, you know? <laughs> uh, I remember walking that yard and it's the first time in my life I ever felt like I was just an absolute nobody, you know. Um, yeah. I remember walking to Chow and, you know, because when you're young, they'll, t they'll sit there and talk to you at first, but 
you're nothing. They don't care about you. They're just even waiting to see if you're going to check in and even make it through this prison sentence. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Especially me. I had long blonde hair. I was a little pretty boy. I used to model when I was younger, too. So, oh, shit. yeah, that's why they used to clown me and say I was from all white, too. You know, I looked like a little pretty boy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, that was it, man. And it's, it's, a. Uh, it was just brutal. So, and I, and I remember the first time I had gotten in a fight right after that. Because I used to box when I was younger too, so I'm a little pretty boy. I used to model, but I used to box too. So, Had hands. And then, yeah, so I was like thinking, I'm like, I gotta show these dudes something. I'm not like just some, some little pretty boy, and I can actually get down too. And when they first told me when I get down, they told me, uh, you know, when they pull you aside and have your little talk, like, what do you want to do and this and that, you know. And I got 12 years for getting snitched on for some people that did the same stuff I did, you know. Yeah. So um, they asked me if I want to put in work, and I'm like, hell yeah, I want to put in work, you know. Um, so crazy story enough, I had to actually beat up my first dude that schooled me my prison pops uh that's the first dude i actually had to put work in oh you had to put hands on him yep my own prison pops uh that was one of the first things i did um and then it's it's weird the second you do that i go out to breakfast uh, once our once our building got off lockdown the day afterwards you know and the second you go out to breakfast now all these ogs want to say what's up youngster i heard what you did blah blah, blah. and now i'm like now they totally changes so it's addicting i'm 18 20 when i finally hit the joint because i did 20 i did 20 months in the county jail fight in my case mm-hmm. um and then when you're so you're 20 years old, I'm super easily impressed. When not to mention that, like I have to listen to all these dudes for the next 12 years of my life mm. if I even get out after 12 years. You know what I mean? Um, I never. I mean, if you would have, I would have bet a million dollars, I would have never ended up getting out of that prison sentence. You know, whether I would have died or end up catching more time, there's no way I thought I'd end up making it out of there. You know? I know when you're when you're young like that, and like you know, they they have like a tier in prison where you know the youngsters have to handle a lot of the business, and then you get to a point where if you're a G, you don't have to do as much, and then OGs kind of kick back. And so I know in your predicament, being you know that you were at that age group, you had to like get involved in a lot of stuff, man. I mean, at what point did you like kind of feel like, man, you know, I gotta try to do something else so that I, I can eventually make it home? Six months before I got out, I was I was addicted to it, man. I was addicted to the to the popularity. It got me beating people up. I was addicted to. Man, I, I, I just, I could always go back to how it was the first time when I walked that yard, I felt like, and we say now, like, I felt like I was a lame. That was the first time in my life I felt like I was a nobody. You know, in high school, my whole life, I was an alpha male, the popular kid, mm-hmm. this and that, even in county jail, I was uh, that, and that prison yard was the first time, you're like, I was like, damn, this is real life now, you know? Um, so it's addicting. I mean, I, I didn't even think about getting out, you know? I was, I, th- I would have bet my life that I would have caught more time and not even made it out, you know? Um, I was addicted to that lifestyle, and I loved it at the time. Mm. You know, that was my family in there, you know? And then at the six point point, what, 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 what changed your mind there? What made you say, hey, you know, I have action that, you know, I'm about to go home, so I need to kind of like change my focus. What? I was in just denial about even going home, you know, because when you, when you first come down, <clears throat> you, get all these, you get all these tickets and stuff, and then you get thrown in maximum security, and then and you're just stacking up these tickets, which all those cost time. They take time from you, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and then when my supposed release date's coming out, I'm like, oh, I should be going home next year. Then I start filing to get my good time back, and then they're taking all my time back from me. So, my little brother says it to this day, when, when I said I had a year and a half left, we stayed there for like the last four years of my sentence, you know, mm. because then I started getting all the old tickets. And then I was still catching new tickets, you know, and, um, and now I was, a, I was a bitter, bitter, mean person in there, you know. So, uh, you know, I've seen dudes come in out three, four damn times for less severe stuff than I was in there for 12 years for. So Just while you were in there, they Absolutely, yeah, yeah they get out and they go out and go get high again, they're coming right back. You know, I'm sitting in the whole time like, how can they not let me out of here, you know? That's all I kept thinking is, how can they not let me out of here? So, um, that I channeled that in the wrong way, you know, and I was just a mean, mean, bitter person in there, you know. So when you when you first got out, how were you able to try to make the adjustments? I mean, what what was your mindset? Being that you had had the prison mentality, how were you able to kind of transition? It was tough at first, man. You know, uh, my last six <clears throat> six or seven months straight was in the hole till I got out from the hole. From the, the yard was called Murder Mori, you know, it's where they kill the cops. That it's the most gangster yard in all our Arizona state prison system is Mori. Um, it's Gladiator School for it. Is, I'm sure you know what that is. Um, and I got out from the hole. In there. That hole, that hard, yard is impossible to go to the hole in. And I went to the hole from there. You know, and that's where I got out from. And you left from the hole at that prison? Mm-hmm. Wow. And I remember banging on the doors, telling the SSU because they were just keeping me in there talking it out. And I'm like, you guys can't expect me to do 12 years in prison, locked in this hole. The only time you leave, you're shackled up to go to your little wreck cage. That's it. And I'm like, I'm I'm getting out for 12 years. I'm like, you <coughs> can't possibly think I'm going to succeed if you let me out of this cell straight under the streets. I yeah, from, from lockdown to yeah. a straight freedom. There's no way like, it's going to work. Yeah. There's no way it's going to work. Um, but they did. And uh, 
thankfully for my family, you know, I owe everything in my life to my family, you know, and I felt like that helped me out a lot with getting institutionalized in there was I still had a lot of visits and stuff. So, because if not, you talk to everybody in the joint, you think that that is real life and you think that's how the world is and the world is nothing like what prison is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, especially, I mean, doing that much time having, you have to have something to kind of um, reflect to, to, to give you a perspective because if you don't have anything on the street, you don't care about anything. You know, no business, nobody that cares. You're like, you kind of just throw the towel in. Absolutely. Just like you could throw the towel in there or throw the towel in on the street. So yeah. it's the same exact thing. Yeah. So that's yeah. the hardest thing is at first, like, all I want to do is get out, you know. And then I get out and I'm like, you know, you're in the honeymoon stage. So nothing's nothing's going to happen bad to you the first two days. Your family's there, they're taking care of you. You don't even have to worry about paying for anything. you got a place to stay, you know. And then once the honeymoon, honeymoon phase starts wearing off, then I'm like, then I say to this day, man, that's then the real tough, tough stuff starts happening, you know, like. Anybody that's a strong, men mentally strong, or not to even say a badass, but just a mentally strong dude, once you get in your little groove of doing prison time, prison's easy, bro. You know, like I was just locked in a cell all damn day pretty much, go to rec when they go to rec. But other than that, I mean, you're just, I don't mean to say chilling, but it kind of is. You know, you get in the little groove and you don't know, say just a routine you got and just, the middle years just fly by, you know. Um, when you get out on the streets, the real, the hard work starts happening, you know, and that's why the recidivism rate's so high, you know. Um, people get out once that honeymoon phase gets over and they have to actually go get a job with all their felonies or with all their prison tattoos you know and I got a neck tattoo I was like thinking how the hell am I gonna get a job now mm -hmm. too and um, so that's when the real hard work starts happening you know once you got to pass through just the fact that I got out of prison and now I need to figure out what I'm gonna do with my life you know and I was so I don't know what the word is but like my brain was so small with like stuff out here that and I had to go through such a big adjustment pay phase because I was, you know, 18 years old. I got locked up, so I was living with obviously mom and dad. Um, and then I get out, and I'm living out with my brother just at, in one of his rooms. And then after a few months, the family's trying to teach me stuff, so then I have to pay rent. And my my brain was so just new to this stuff. I had to start paying. The deal was I had to start paying my little brother $150 a month rent to rent his room out, right? And my dad's the kind of one that negotiated this whole deal. And I'm like, $150 I'm gonna have to pay every month, you know? But I didn't know anything. I never had to pay rent. I never had yeah, to pay anything. Yeah. I never had a car payment. I never yeah. had to pay anything in my life. And Cell like, phone bill. Yeah. yeah. So that's how. But that's how small you're, and you, you got to grow that. So like, and that's the biggest adjustment people get now is you don't even think about that because when you're in there, all you think about is I got to get out. I got to get out. Exactly. I gotta get out, Just I freedom get out. first, and that's then it, you don't. And then everything yeah. else comes later. But people don't even think about the other stuff. So I feel like it helped me out a lot of time. Maybe that I had so much cell time to think, you know, and I wasn't just chilling on some two yard playing basketball, and then you just get out and you don't even worry about the drug addiction you're gonna have to still worry about once you get out on the streets or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, I had a ton of time, and I was. Uh, had nothing but time to think about that stuff. So it helped me out a lot. And then, so when I'm going from paying 150 a month, then it's a, kind of an adjustment. I'm like doing this, I'm like, dang. And then I'm like, they'll get my own apartment. It's all like baby steps, man, you know? And, it's, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a big believer, it's all in, it's capitalizing off what you know and who you know, you know? So I have, I have an eighth grade education, you know? I didn't get through freshman year high school because like I said, I started experimenting, experimenting with drugs real early when I got into high school. So I get out, I'm covered in prison tattoos, 30 years old, never had a job in my life, and with an eighth grade education, you mm. know? Um, and not to mention that, like, the, they don't even tell you the other hard stuff you gotta worry about. So someone has mysteriously got a driving on a suspended under my name through the ADOT, so I have to wait two and a half months even to get my license. So, I mean, who can survive like that? If people that don't have a great family like I had, how could you expect them to survive and not yeah. go back to prison? Yeah. Getting chauffeured around every two and a half months, or- People get for, tired of it. Absolutely, no one can do it. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to make it out and stay out, you know, but a few people can, you know, and, um, that's why I, I love what you're doing, man, because uh, it's so hard for people to do that and to get the message across, you know. So after after getting out and, and initially getting situated with your brother, were you clean at this point as far as from drugs and kind of focused on employment? I was clean from drugs. But I was still drinking because you got to figure this. I had never been to a bar in my life. Mm. So I'm 30 years old. I got to go start drinking and stuff, right? You know, I'm entitled to that. You know, I had never been to a bar before. I did 12 years of my life in prison. I'm like, all right, I got to go do this. So, and then especially with my addictive personality, the second I go out to the, mm. to the bar scene, I'm like, tomorrow. And then, and then the, the days start going from, I'm d going to the gym, trying to do whatever productive, halfway looking for jobs online or something, to, and then going to the bar at 7 o'clock at night. And then it starts 6, 5, 4 o'clock, and it starts going earlier and earlier. Mm. And then before all, you know it, you're just drinking and partying. And, Headed back to prison, I wasn't even thinking about it, you know?